Hello, everybody. This is Satya Malik from learnopencv.com. In this video, we will explain the problem of gaze tracking. This video is made for absolute beginners. So we will cover the subject in detail from the very beginning. So if you want to know about gaze tracking, this is the video for you. We will start from the very basics. We will explain what the problem of gaze tracking is. Then we will move on to how the ground truth for gaze tracking is collected. What are the systems used for collecting the ground truth for gaze tracking? We will then explain the data sets available for gaze tracking. And finally, we will cover the algorithms used for gaze tracking without the need for specialized hardware. So this is a complete package. We'll cover pretty much all the relevant topics. So you will get a very general overview but if you want to dig deep into it, look at the references that we have shared. They are very useful. Now let's get started. So the very first problem is what is gaze tracking? There are two different setups for gaze tracking. In the first setup, it is called screen-based gaze tracking or remote gaze tracking, where the objective is to find out where the person is looking on a screen, as you can see in this picture. And the objective is to find the X and Y location on the screen where the person's gaze is targeted. Now you may be wondering why this person is laughing. I have no idea. Anyways, moving on. The second kind of gaze tracking is called wearable or near eye gaze tracking. Here we have a slightly more complicated setup where we have a person wearing glasses and these glasses have a camera called the scene camera. The scene camera is usually located at the center of the glasses. And our objective is to find the X and Y location on the screen camera frame where the person's gaze is fixed. So in both systems, we have an image or a video frame and we want to find the X and Y location of the person's gaze on this frame. And you can see that it's a two camera system actually. In one frame, we are looking at the scene camera or the screen. And then there is another camera looking at the person's eyes. And that is how we are going to find what the person is looking at. So here you can see a camera which is not visible, but there is a small camera and it is looking at the person's eye. And in this system, there is a camera, again, not visible, and this camera is looking at the person's face. So we have a camera system looking at the person's face or eyes, and another camera system or screen at which the person is looking. Let's look at the eye camera. Turns out that it is not usually a simple camera. It is a system of a camera plus some IR lights. Sometimes there are more than one cameras, sometimes there are more than one IR lights, but there is at least usually one camera and one IR light. And the reason IR lights are used is because it illuminates the eyes, you get a better contrast image, and because it is IR, the human eye cannot perceive it, so it doesn't affect our eyes, and we are able to still see properly, and this image is also good. And this is what an image from the eye camera looks like. So now we are ready to formulate the gaze estimation problem. We have the input image looking at this image on the left and the image on the right. We have to formulate where is the gaze of the person. So this red target sign shows you where is the gaze of the person. And the input that we are using is this image. And we can use other sensors as well, but this is the primary thing. We are going to use this image on the left to figure out where is the person looking in this image. And this image is the view from the camera, the scene camera. And this image is the image of an eye as seen through the eye camera. The situation is similar when we are looking at a screen. We have this input image, and based on this input image, we need to figure out the gaze location on this screen. So we have this beautiful setup. Now the question is, how do we collect ground truth? Now, before we can 
formulate some algorithms, we need to know what is the gaze of the person? How do we find where the person is looking? And this is done simply using two different kinds of methods. One of them is called active method. In this case, the person is asked to fixate on a particular location on the screen. And because we know the location of the screen, it could be some animation we show at that location of the screen. Therefore, we are able to have ground truth. We know the image of the eye when it is looking at that location. And we can create many such points and ask the user to fixate on these points. And that is how ground truth is collected. But there is a second method also, which is passive. And in this method, the user is asked to do just regular computer usage. And as they are using their computer, there are certain things which require you to fixate on certain locations. For example, if you are clicking on a button, then usually you are looking at the button. When you are double clicking on text, you are looking at that text. So using this passive information where you are not actively asking the user to fix their gaze on something, you are collecting data as they are going about their day-to-day -day work. So that's another way of collecting ground truth data for gaze estimation. Let's look at some of the features of the eye that help us determine the gaze. The very first one is the location of the pupil. And there are several algorithms for detecting the pupil. But even before we go into the algorithms, let's look at the setup. There are two different kinds of setup. One is called dark pupil. In this setup, the camera and the light source are not co-located. They are located at two separate locations. And this is the kind of image you get. The pupil is dark. The second setup is when the camera and the light source, they are co-located. And so the light bounces from the retina and creates this white spot. This is the exact same phenomenon that we see in red eye, which happens in systems where the flash is almost co-located with the camera. In either case, the pupil is either very dark or very bright. And that is the signal which is used to extract the pupil from the rest of the image. There are also two different camera configurations that are usually used to image the eye. In this configuration, the view of the eye is unobstructed. This is an easier setup, but if you look at the image that it produces, the accuracy is much lower because the image is tilted. On the other hand, we can create an image which looks as if the person is looking straight into the camera by using a beam splitter. However, this is a more involved setup and the benefit is that the accuracy could be much higher because you can see that the pupil looks like a perfect circle. It is well illuminated. Uh, the eye is more visible and it is easier image to deal with. There are several challenges in detecting pupil for example, the viewpoint could be very different. The person could be wearing glasses. The eyes could be partially closed. And sometimes the eyelashes cover the eyes. There is also a lot of variation in the natural shape of the eyes. And we also have to deal with image quality and variation in lighting conditions. So it is a challenging problem based on the application. In some applications, we can control for a lot of these variations. For example, in medical applications, we can control a lot of these problems. But in gaming applications, it becomes very difficult to control because pupil need to be tracked at, say, 60 frames a second in gaming applications when you're wearing a headset. The algorithms for pupil detection vary a lot. There are many classical implementations where we do edge detection followed by ellipse fitting, and then we use information from low level vision to find the location of the pupil. And the modern methods are deep learning based. For example, NVIDIA's NV Gaze uses a CNN based pupil detector. Before we understand other features of the eye which are useful for gaze estimation, 
let's look at a simple model of the human eye. So we have the human eye. It is very much like a camera. It has a lens which directs the light rays onto this screen called the retina. And it also has this iris which controls an opening called the pupil. So light goes through the pupil, refracts through the lens, and an image is projected onto the retina. There is an outer transparent covering over the pupil, which is called cornea. Now, the line connecting the center of the pupil to the center of the lens is called the optical axis of the eye. And you would think that this is the direction of gaze, but it is not. Turns out there is a place on the retina where the image is focused and this is where the sharpest image is formed. It is called the fovea. And this is the direction of visual gaze. It is not the optical axis, but the line connecting the fovea to the center of the lens that determines the visual gaze. The angle between the visual axis and the optical axis is called the kappa angle, or sometimes it's also called the alpha angle in literature. Now, we are really interested in the gaze and not the optical axis. However, it is impossible to estimate the visual axis using images directly. So we need a user-specific calibration to estimate the visual axis given the optical axis. Usually this angle kappa is about five degrees. The calibration process is rather simple. You ask the user to focus on one dot at a time, uh, let's say the blue dots, and estimate the gaze direction, which is shown using the green dots. And then you calculate the offset between the real gaze and the estimated gaze. And you store this user-specific information. And when you estimate gaze next time, you can fix this estimate by accounting for this user-specific calibration. Now let's look at some other features that can be useful in estimating the gaze direction. When the light ray hits the cornea, it forms an image. You can see the location of the corneal reflection right here. And the pupil also forms an image and we have methods to estimate the location of the pupil. The line connecting the pupil to the cornea is very informative in estimating the gaze direction. And there is a whole class of algorithms called pupil center corneal reflection algorithms, which use this arrow to estimate the gaze direction. Now, there is no reason to restrict ourselves to just these two features. In fact, there are many methods which use the center of the pupil, the corneal reflection, the iris location, as well as the contours of the eyes together to find the gaze direction. Using the image of the eye or the features extracted from the image of the eye to estimate the direction of gaze in the scene image is called gaze mapping. And obviously we have two different setups for calculating gaze mapping. There are various methods for gaze mapping. The first class of methods are called feature-based methods. And among feature-based methods, the first one is 3D geometric model-based method where they create a 3D model of the eye and sometimes the head. Sometimes they also use RGBD cameras. And the idea is that from this image, they extract the parameters of the 3D model and then they go to estimate the gaze direction. So here, the mapping goes through a 3D model. The mapping from this image to the gaze direction, it goes through a 3D model. So it is very physically based. In fact, high-end commercial systems use this kind of technology. However, there is also a mathematical approach where an explicit 3D model is not used. Instead, they use a 2D regression-based method. The idea is that you have a whole bunch of features here and you set it up as a regression problem and solve for the gaze direction. One way is to fit a polynomial for the x and y coordinates of gaze based on these features. Another way is to use support vector regression. And of course, you can also use neural networks. 
The third method is called cross-ratio based method. It is based on a clever lighting configuration and it is used in case of gaze mapping on screens. So you put four lights on the four ends of the screen and because you know the dimensions of the screen, you know the 3D geometry of this configuration. And then you put a camera and the light source which are co-located and this will create a bright pupil. And so we know the center of the pupil and we know the reflection of these lights in the eye, as you can see in this image. If you consider the surface of the cornea is a plane, which is not, but suppose we approximate it using a plane. In that case, using the location of the pupil center and the glint produced by the four light sources, we can find the gaze direction uniquely. It is a closed form solution. Another class of algorithms for gaze mapping is called appearance based. Here, the objective is to recreate a patch of the eye using something like 3D morphable model for the eye region, and then using this synthesized model to estimate the gaze. In feature based method, we extracted some features to estimate gaze. In appearance based model, we try to recreate the appearance of the eye and that's how we estimate gaze. Now there is a trade-off between how much complexity we want in our system and what is the accuracy. The 3D model based systems are usually the most accurate. They also require a lot of calibration. They usually have more hardware attached to them. And the appearance based models are the lowest in terms of accuracy as well as in setup complexity. And this trade-off is captured in the table shown here. Now we are ready to go over some recent trends in gaze estimation and tracking. The biggest of them is the use of synthetic data. In 2015, the data set Synthes Eyes was released. It used high quality 3D scans to create photorealistic rendering of the eye region. And of course, the annotation was automatic. So now we can work at scale because you can literally render unlimited amount of synthetic data as long as your modeling is correct. The data set consists of 11,382 synthetic RGB images with large variations in head pose and gaze direction. Also note that the lighting is quite different. The eye shape, the eye color, etc., are very different. So it is a very rich data set with many variations. And in 2016, a new data set called Unity Eyes was released. It's a massive data set of 1 million synthetic RGB images. And they have also released the tool which you can use to produce your own synthetic data. In 2019, NVIDIA released NVGaze, which is a massive data set of 2 million images. Unlike other data sets, these are not RGB images, but IR images. And they have also provided labels like the gaze direction, eye location, pupil location, and region labels with each image. They have also released a real data set consisting of 35 people. It has 2.5 million images, and it also has gaze direction and illumination direction. In 2016, a new paper was published called SimGAN, which pushed a very interesting idea. They started with synthetic data, where you can look at this image, which is purely synthetic, but it doesn't look very realistic. So to solve that problem, they used unlabeled real images, and using GANs, they were able to refine this synthetic image to look more realistic. The idea is that you have two kinds of losses, one is trying to make it more realistic, and one is trying to make it not too far away from the original synthetic image. And by optimizing this loss function, you're able to create something which looks realistic, but also has the qualities of the original synthetic image. There is also a trend of gathering large real data sets. And when I go over a few of these data sets, you will notice the variety of approaches people take 
to gather ground truth data. It's quite fascinating. The first important data set was released in 2013. It is called UT Multi View Dataset. It consists of 64,000 real images with 50 subjects and eight cameras. Now, if you look at their setup, it's a very interesting setup. The face is static. In fact, the face is on a chin rest so that the head does not move. And to find different viewpoints, they use eight different cameras. And they ask the user to focus on 160 different gaze directions. But it gets even more interesting. From this real data set, they create 1.15 million synthetic data sets where they simulate 144 virtual cameras because using the eight cameras, they are able to get a point cloud of the person's face. And so they can re-render the face from different viewpoints, which they call virtual cameras. So from eight cameras, they could go to 144 virtual cameras. And now you have a huge data set. In 2014, the IDAP data set was released. And again, look at how different the data collection effort here is compared to the previous method. Here they used two different cameras, an RGB camera and an RGBD depth camera. They gathered 62,500 images, 94 sessions, and 16 different people. And the gaze was estimated in two different ways. There were on-screen targets, as we had described before, but there was also a 3D orange ball as shown in these pictures. So you can see people try many different techniques for creating the ground truth for gaze estimation. 2015 MPII gaze dataset was released. It is a massive dataset consisting of 213,659 RGB images of 15 people. And these people were recorded in natural setting using their laptop. The laptop camera and the screen were calibrated and the user was asked to look at patterns every 10 minutes. Uh, the beauty of this data set is that you see people using their laptop in many different settings. So it's a pretty diverse data set. It is limited to laptops, but still a very impressive data set. But if you really want to generate real data at scale, you have to use crowdsourcing. And that is what Gaze Capture did in 2016. It is a data set of 2.5 million RGB images, and it consists of 1,474 people. The group created an iPad app, and using Amazon's Mechanical Turk, they found 1,474 people to take part in this Gaze estimation data set. Of course, when you're doing crowdsourcing, you have to be very careful that people are being honest. So the app had built-in mechanism to make sure that the people were gazing in the right direction and they were not simply relying on people's honesty. They confirmed that people were actually gazing in the right direction using several interesting mechanisms. You should read the paper to know more. Another very interesting data set is called RT Gene, which was published in 2018. It consists of 122,531 labeled training images and 154,755 unlabeled images. Now, this data set consists of 15 subjects, nine male and six female, and two participants were recorded twice. The beauty of this data set is that it records extreme head pose. Now, the mechanism by which they captured this data is also pretty fascinating. They had eye tracking glasses, as you can see here. The eye tracking glass also had these mocap markers, which you can see on the side here. And they also had an RGBD camera. The RGBD camera too had mocap markers. In addition, they had a mocap system. So the goal of the mocap system was to detect these mocap markers. And once you have detected these mocap markers, you can find the coordinate system attached to the RGBD camera, as well as the coordinate system 
attached to the eye tracking glasses. The RTG dataset creators had to deal with one additional problem. Because they were using eye tracking glasses, the face was occluded by these eye tracking glasses. And of course, it did not look good in the RGBD image and you could not use them directly for training. So they used GAN-based in-painting to remove the glasses. And finally, in 2019, Facebook released a very important dataset called OpenEDS. It was captured using virtual reality head-mounted display and there were 152 participants. The first set of data that they have released is for semantic segmentation. So you have this eye image and you have the segmentation of the eye regions and they have about 12,759 annotated image. These are pixel level annotations for different eye regions and there are 12,759 of them. They also have published about 252,690 images which are unlabeled. Labeling takes a lot of time. So the data they had collected, which is still not labeled, they have released it to the public. In addition, they have sequence data set, which consists of 1.5 second clips acquired at 200 Hertz. If you want to do any video analysis, the sequence data set would come in handy. And finally, they have this eye topography for 142 subjects out of the 152 and you get a point cloud of the shape of the iris. So really important data set, especially if you are going to use eye tracking in head mounted displays. Now let's look at some recent algorithmic trends. To understand these trends, let's look at a paper called Recurrent CNN for 3D Gaze Estimation Using Appearance and Shape Cues, because I think this paper combines a lot of new thoughts. The first thing to note is that it combines temporal information. So it's making a decision based on temporal data, not just one image. The second thing to note is it's extracting the face, normalizing it. It's also extracting the eye region separately. And then it is also using facial landmark detection on top of all this information and combining this three pieces of information. Now, you may be thinking, why is the entire face necessary? Shouldn't we be able to estimate gaze based on the eyes alone? The answer is not quite. There is this effect called Wollaston's effect, which you can see here. The eyes are not changing. However, the pose of the person is completely different based on how the face is drawn. So you get an idea now that the entire face is important while estimating gaze and not just the eye region. And that is why they are combining all this three information. Uh, how do you combine these three pieces of information? They run the face and the eye regions through a bank of convolutional layers, followed by fully connected layers. In essence, they have converted these images into feature vectors. And finally, they concatenate all these features into one tall vector. And then they use RNN to combine temporal information and make a prediction. So that paper kind of summarizes some of the new thoughts in gaze tracking. Just to summarize the new trends, here are a few things that we discussed. First of all, there is a trend towards large synthetic data sets. And we also know that there is a trend towards application specific data sets. Because once you are in synthetic domain, you do not need to have generic data sets. You can generate the data set, which is very specific to your application. For gathering real data set, there is a trend towards crowdsourcing and automatic annotation. We are also seeing that for real ground truth, they use as many sensors as possible. There are many different methods and I don't think there has been a consolidation of what technique is the best. So there is a lot of experimentation going on when it comes to real data generation or real ground truth data generation. In terms of algorithms, there is a trend towards using the full face as well as facial features 
while doing eye gaze estimation, not just the eye region. And when we are talking about free form gaze tracking where no devices are involved, in those cases, CNNs and RNNs are playing a bigger role. That is all we wanted to cover about gaze tracking. Thank you so much.